In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us put ourselves in the presence of the Lord. Lord, graciously give us your Holy Spirit. Guide us from within. Give us your light, your discernment. Incline our will toward yours. Kindle our heart with the fire of your Holy Spirit. We ask you this through the powerful intercession of Our Lady, who is always present among us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and in the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good evening, uh, everybody, and welcome back to uh, reading and studying St. John of the Cross, Book 2, Dark Knight. We are uh, starting Chapter 6. So without, without further ado, let us follow the text. So last time we finished Chapter 5, and today we are, this lesson, we are starting at Chapter 6. Now, remember, he gave us two reasons why uh, we feel this uh, pain and oppression and uh, the end of the goods, uh, the everything is ending and so forth. He gave us two reasons, and now he is starting to give us two more reasons. So we are now at the third one, and then we will have the uh, fourth one. So on the other kinds of pain that the soul suffers in this night. The third kind of suffering and pain that the soul endures in this uh, state results from the fact that two other extremes meet here in one, namely the divine and the human. So finally, the divine comes to the, to, uh, the encounter with the human, the human. So you might ask, so what happened then before? The, the person had a long journey before, had a second conversion, had um, a warfare, an effort, uh, maintaining this effort, ensuring steady growth and so forth, uh, choosing Jesus about, uh, above uh, material goods and so forth, reaching you, purification of the sense, union of will and so forth. So what was all this? Wasn't it the divine and the human meeting remember it was the divine yes but it's divine adapted adapting himself to us now he's not adapting himself anymore he wants to adapt us to him so he's not adapting himself to us he is adapting us to him so he's not changing how he is so in a way for the first time the gospel is communicated. You see, this is why I say it's a good news. It's a second good news in our life. The divine is communicated to the human. The divine in this purgative contemplation, and the, is, sorry, this purgative contemplation, and the human is the subject, the human being, no? That is the soul, okay? So the contemplation or the purgative contemplation is God himself. Simple as that. The Holy Spirit himself. Okay, God is himself is given to us. He is giving himself to us as he is. The divine assails the soul in order to renew it and thus to make it divine. Translation is correct. Hacerla divina. And stripping it of desnudandola, remember desnudes, desnudandola, the verb here, of the habitual affections and attachments of the old man. Remember what we said in the previous video in Peter, that's the old man in him reacting. No, 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 you won't die. Uh, I will follow you. I will die for you and so forth. Who is talking here? The fervor of the old man. So we need to be very careful. Fervor doesn't necessarily mean new, new man or new creature. It could be the old man in us, you see. 
the old man doesn't know his limits. The, the old man is not purified yes, uh, uh, yet in us. So, <clears throat> Lord, the, the divine, which means this contemplation, this new um, intervention of God in, in us, is stripping uh, uh, us from the habitual affections and attachments of the old man. To spiritual things, to spiritual bearings, to spiritual knowledge of Jesus. You know, the first knowledge that Peter has of Jesus is still a knowledge, but it's a knowledge mixed. To which it is very united. You say cl closely, uh, closely is not in the Spanish. To which it is very united. What is united with what? The habitual affections and attachment are united, are one with the old man, one with us. The old man is, is us, is our way of functioning, an old way of functioning, but it's us. So you see here the problem. We are united to our own affections and attachment. They are part of us. And God is stripping them. So it's like taking chunks of our being out because this is not God knit together the affections and attachments knit together with the old man and conformed conformed to one made one conformed one form so <clears throat> he's stripping it and destroys and consumes its spiritual substance and absorbs it in deep and profound darkness. So the divine assails, destroys and consumes its spiritual substance. Translation is correct, substantial is spiritual and absorbs it in deep and profound darkness, absorbiéndola en una profunda y honda tiniebla. Okay? So, that's the result of God's uh, action. It's strange, no? He uses a, a, a very rough expression here. He says, destroys and consumes. If, since, uh, why, why he's saying this? Since, he used a very powerful expression before. He says uh, two expressions, united and knit together. He says that our affections and our attachments of the old man in us are united and knit to our being, are part of our being. So there is a union here, but it's not a good union. So if God wants to strip, remove, these affection and attachment, what is the consequence if it, they are united to us? We have the impression that he's destroying us. You see, since we are united, if you are united to your affections and attachment, if he removes the affection and attachments, well, you have the impression to be yourself destroyed. Does God want to destroy the human being? No. Does God want to remove everything that is not God? Yes. Is it painful? Yes. Does God want it to be painful? No. Do you follow? You see? Consumes its spiritual sub substance. You see, that's it's a little bit shocking, no? Spiritual substance, which means the soul and the spirit. Material, physical, and spiritual. Spiritual here is uh, versus uh, material, physical. Okay? And absorbs it in the deep and profound darkness. It's absorbing, he strips and absorbs it. Hmm? <clears throat> okay? As a result of this, the soul feels itself to be perishing and melting away. I just explained it, no? Uh, destroy and consume. In the presence and sight of its miseries. As we said, no? They pop up, they are visible, you can see your own miseries, and it's, it's, you feel that you're gone. 
There is no no future. Imagine Peter, no, discovering, uh, watching himself how how he denied Jesus three times, just to take one example, no. And you can take much more. He said, no, 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 I will come and follow you, and I will die for you. Well, die for me? You 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 can't. You you ran. You ran. You escaped. So the sight of its miseries. That's the action of God showing, removing, stripping. Then I can see it. If he strips it, I can see it. In a cruel spiritual death. When we say spiritual here, we mean that it's not material. It's happening in the soul and the spirit. This is what it means. It doesn't mean that the, it's not alluding to the spiritual death that you can find in the book of Revelation. That's something else. Spiritual death here means um, the the the, uh, the depth of our, my being are tortured, are, are squashed, or ground grounded completely by uh, the action of God. So it's a cruel cruel death, even as if it had been um, uh, like as as if it has been swallowed by a beast and felt itself being devoured in the darkness of its belly, suffering such anguish as was endured by Jonas in the belly of the beast of the sea. Just an image, but what is happening inside of the belly of this big beast? Hmm? Perishing, melting away, the presence and sight of its misery, miseries, plural, in a cruel spiritual death. For in the sep sepulchre of dark death, it must ne needs abide until the spiritual resurrection which it hopes for. So it's as if we are in a tomb, dark death, and then we abide in this tomb until the spiritual resurrection will occur, our own spiritual resurrection. Just a little parenthesis, I'm not sure you would think he's thinking about this, but when you read the life of, of St. Anthony, uh, St. Anthony the Great, uh, you find that um, in, in one of the stages, because what's interesting in the life of Anthony the Great, written by St. Athanasius, who, who knew him um, when he was young, uh, and afterward, because Antony came to Alexandria to, the, to help Athanasius in his um, defense for the true faith about Jesus' divinity. Uh, Athanasius writes St. Antony's uh, life and its life and spiritual life intertwined. So he talks about his second conversion when he enters in the church and hears the gospel, leave everything, go and sell the, uh, go and sell everything, give the money to the poor and then come and follow me. And then he starts to venture into the desert. So from the outer part of the desert, uh, closer to the Nile where uh, you have a community and then he goes deeper and deeper. And, and in the further stages, he dwells in uh, a, a cemetery. So he enters into a sepulcher or, or a tomb and he closes himself and stays there for a while. So I don't know if John of the Cross is talking about this, but that's very interesting to see uh, this little um, connection um, between the two. But as you can see here, it's, it's, um, um, it's, it's a moment, it's, it's a moment. No? So for, for in this sepulchre of dark death, it must needs abide until the spiritual resurrection, which it hopes for. A description of this suffering and pain, although in truth it transcends all description. So remember that even though he gives images, when we go through it, it's, it's something else. It transcends, it goes beyond any expression or image or example is given by David when he says the lamentations of death compassed me about the pains of hell surrounded me I cried in my tribulation Psalm 17 verse 5 through to 7 but what the sorrowful soul feels most 
in this condition is its clear perception as it thinks that God has abandoned it. And in his ab abhorrence of it, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, otherwise please correct me, has flung it, say again? Abhorrence. Oh, abhorrence, sorry. In his, thank you, of his abhorrence of it, has flung it into darkness. And it is a grave and piteous grief for it to believe that God has forsaken it. So, remember, the, 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 the greatest, uh, the cause of the greatest pain comes from the fact that the, the person feels that God has abandoned it abandoned now of course if somebody and i need your attention here because sometimes we can mix things we can go through a certain experience and then say but this is then the dark night do we have similar experiences but only similar on the surface but in fact, they are deeply different. Of course, yes. If a person is not faithful to the graces that he or she received in baptism and so forth, if the person who has faith is not abiding with the light of faith and the grace of God, the person can start to lose faith. Faith is not a stable given thing. We are not born with a certain quantity of faith and then we will die with the same quantity. Not at all. Faith is a seed. You take care as a good gardener of the seed, the faith will grow. You feed it, you water it, give it sun, give it water, it will grow. But if you neglect to feed your faith, then we go backward and whatever we had we can even lose it. So if a person out of negligence, God forbid, God forbid, starts to lose the faith that he or she had for many reasons, no? I can be tempted. I can be tempted by thoughts against faith. I can be tempted by false truth, no? No? Uh, I can be following certain philosophies, I can following certain interpretations of the Bible and so forth, and I start to lose faith. That's that we, we saw that in the in the recent decades. Now this person will reach a point where there is no spiritual life at all, and the, the faith that the person had is gone. Now this person will be sub submerged by doubts. True doubts. Does, does, exist? does God exist? Is Jesus God? Did, did Jesus really exist? Is the Bible really inspired? What is the Blessed Sacrament? Is there confession? Is there priesthood? And so forth. You know, the whole, the whole, the whole elements or all the elements of our faith. You start to have doubts. And then you are continuing with the same style of life. Of course, this is. This is not a person growing in spiritual life, but this is a person going astray, uh, God, God forbid. Now, as a consequence, the person will feel the same here, which is what? That the God has abandoned her or God doesn't exist. You can use different descriptions. Now, is this a dark night? Is the person going through a dark night? Do you understand the problem? That how so easily we use the expression dark night to describe certain situation which had no, which have nothing to do with the dark night as St. John of the Cross describes it. And the first one to use the expression is St. John of the Cross. But now it is so spread that we forgot from where it comes. I lived in a time where the word wasn't used that much. And I, and I saw 
it being used more and more and more and more until we reach a point where we lost from the, the, uh, the origin of it, from where it comes. You see? So if you have a person, if you meet a person who say, well, God has ab abandoned me, uh, I, I have great doubts, I don't believe anymore as I used to believe, it's finished, all is gone. You might say, oh, well, this, this person is going uh, through uh, the dark, a dark night. Or the, it's the dark night described by St. John of the Cross. Do you understand the problem? They don't have anything to do one with the other. And we still are capable of saying, oh, that's the dark night. Why? Because one says something and the other word says the same thing i have doubts about god god had abandoned had, has abandoned me but one has this feeling because he or she is progressing in spiritual life and and uh, now god started to work in this person so as a result we have this perception which has nothing to do with the perception that the consequence of the acts of another person who slowly but unfortunately steadily abandoned uh, uh, his or her faith for philosophies, other thoughts, other uh, doctrine or ideologies or, 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 or just simple atheism. You see what I'm trying to say? So we need to be very careful. This is a result of abundance and this is a result of losing faith. This is growing in faith, and the other one is losing faith. You might have this apparently the same um, phenomenon uh, or manifest external manifestation or word or description, but has nothing to do one with the other. This person we are with right now, described by John of the Cross, is still wanting to pray, is still trying to abide with God and so forth, but is struggling. While the other one neglected the faith. It's totally different. So, but what this, the sorrowful soul feels most in this condition, this new action of God, is its clear perception that God has abandoned it. Abandoned it. And God abhors it, rejects it, considers this person like totally negative and flung it into darkness. It has a grave and piteous grief for it, uh, for it, for it to believe, it is, sorry, a grave and piteous grief for it to believe that God has forsaken it. That's the paradox. It's a huge paradox. How come God is drawing closer and how come we are feeling the exact opposite? You, need, you see, abhorrence, abhor, abhorrence, abhorrence, which means considers it uh, as bad about herself no it's, it's it's rejecting her because she is bad it is this that david also felt so much in a like case saying after the manner, manner wherein the wounded are dead in, this, in the sepulchres, being now cast off by thy hand, so that thou, that thou rememberest them no more, even so have they set me in the deepest and lowest lake, in the dark places and in the shadow of death. And thy fury is... Fury is confirmed upon me, and all thy waves thou hast brought in upon me. So, you see how John of the Cross sees this passage of Psalm 87, which is a, a very dark psalm. 
uh, verse 6 to 8, um, he sees that this is that. <clears throat> For indeed, when this purgative contemplation is most severe, the soul feels very keenly the shadow of death and the lamentations of death and the pains of hell. which consists in its feeling itself to be without God and chastised and cast out and unworthy of him. And it feels that he is wroth with it. All this is felt by the soul in this condition. Yeah, and more, for it believes that it is so with it forever. So the most painful word in this entire paragraph is the word forever. In this entire paragraph, from, from in, for indeed until forever, the most painful part is forever. Why? Because what characterizes hell compared to uh, purgatory is that hell is forever. Purgatory, you still have hope. Hell, you don't have hope. That's according to Catholic doctrine, classic one. This is what characterizes uh, the difference between the two painful places or painful states better be, because this is what they are, no? states rather than places. Okay. So, yeah. It feels too, I mean, I mean, remember Peter. During these hours, after Jesus' death or a bit before, because he denies his master and then goes, he disappears. Is he following Jesus? Is he seeing Jesus from far? We don't know. Maybe yes, maybe no. John is there, but Peter, we don't know. Now, put yourself in the shoes, in Peter's shoes. What, what, did, what, what is happening? You're lost. You're completely lost. Your master is uh, treated so badly, is crucified and is about to die or is already dead. You denied him. So there is no hope. He died. Do you believe in resurrection? No. You don't even know what is resurrection in this case. He said, I will rise. What well, all what they what he heard was, I will die. But what comes after that I will rise, he doesn't register this, it doesn't enter in his mind. So what is his state? What is the state of Peter? Just I'm I'm doing this just to show you how. This is not far from the core of the gospel, which is the passion. Forgive me if I'm doing this, because I know that this is not part of St. John of the Cross teaching, direct teaching. But I'm trying to ease it a little bit or to show you that it's part of our faith. It's not far-fetched what he's saying. So what is what are the feelings of Peter? He lost everything. Because he gave everything for Jesus. He left his job. He was a fisherman. He left his wife. We know from the gospel that he was married. Jesus healed his mother-in-law. So therefore he was married. He followed Jesus for three, um, three, three years roughly. He gave everything for him. He's a very generous and good man. And then Jesus disappears. Jesus dies. So imagine your state. Your, your, the state of your hope. What do you expect in life? You lost everything. The fool you are. You lost everything. You follow the crazy man and now he's, de he's dead. But yes, of course. You follow the crazy man. Jesus, and now he's dead. Fool you are. 
and you betrayed him. And he said he will rise, but you don't even understand what is to be to to rise. You know that he's in he's buried there. And the very first moment when you can move, because you can't move on Saturday, it's a holy Sabbath. It's Easter. You can only move the day after. So at the very early hours, you hear women telling you that he's, he's risen, etc. You are confused. You don't understand anything. But imagine the hours between 3 p.m. Friday and till the early hours of, 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 of Sunday. What is your state? Isn't it similar to this? You lost everything. Your hopes are all gone. Your sins are bigger than, than you. It's, it's, um, it's an extremely harsh experience. Especially that you followed him every day. He was in front of you every day of your life for three for three years. Imagine having having Jesus with you three three years. What an incredible experience! Witnessing all the miracles he he did, witnessing the transfiguration, witnessing amazing things, and even yourself preaching and and performing miracles in his name. Because this is what the gospel says that the apostles were sent by Jesus. Very, very earlier on. So all this happens, and then everything is gone, totally gone. He died. He's buried. The one who rose Lazarus from the dead now is dead. It's finished. He can't heal. He didn't escape from his death. We thought he was a king, but he didn't defend himself. So it's like something wrong. It's like something here is wrong. He was supposed to escape. He was supposed to defend himself. He, he, he has the power. He didn't use his power. So who is he then? You see all these thoughts. And what about Peter's life? What will he do? You see, it's, it's hell. It's hell. As John of the Cross says, it's hell. I'm just trying to show you how the loss is immense. And here, the loss is immense. You love Jesus. You followed Jesus. You were united to him day and night for three years. And then suddenly Jesus goes. The, the only thing that you had in your life is gone. And you didn't, you didn't do anything wrong. It's not your fault. Apart from his sin, of course, of denying Jesus and so forth. But apart from this, there's nothing deeply wrong from, Jesus, from Peter's side. And despite all that, he's gone. It's like, what did, I, did we do? Why did he go? Where did he go? And, and, and what about us now? You see, all these thoughts. And I, I think that they, there is some light, mutual light shed one over the other. The Peter after the resurrection is a different Peter. He learned the, the extreme hard way, uh, an, an incredible lesson. The only lesson one needs to learn in life. There's only one lesson. This is what St. Therese says. I thank God for this. The greatest grace I received from him is to, um, to show me, him, him to show me my nothingness. Imagine, imagine this is a grace. She considers this as being the, the, the greatest grace. Why? Because it's the liberation of the of, of myself, of me, the I. I'm I'm freed. I'm nothing. Okay, but now I'm free. You see, while before I thought I could do this, I could do that, I'm following him, I'm doing something good, etc. No, 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 zero, nothing. You see. <clears throat> Okay, so the most painful bit is the forever. Does Peter believe in the resurrection? No, he's going to find a bo dead body. Nobody believed in the resurrection. Only Mary, the mother of Jesus. So the death is a forever death. The loss of Jesus is a forever loss. You see, 
So it's similar to, to hell. So they dive. They, they, they dive. They're forced to dive in this uh, ex uh, hell, hellish experience. It feels too that all creatures have forsaken it. Uh, we saw that, hmm? particularly by its friends. You feel that all your friends are abandoning you, they're going in a different direction, they don't understand you, you don't understand them, it's confusing. But it is meant to be like this. Why? Because God wants to be mine, entirely mine, and no competition with any other person. Only God needs to reign in my heart. So therefore, any help, any attachment, any comfort, he removes it his way. All creatures have forsaken it, and that it is con contemned by them, particularly by its friends. Contemned, uh, desprecio, to how can we say contempt in in uh, in English uh, synonym, uh, Francesca? Please, despised, despised, uh, despised. Yes, yes, um, yes. Held, held in contempt. Despised. No, no, no. Uh, despised is stronger. No, no. Despised. Desprecio. Despised. Siente de todas las criaturas. Desamparo y desprecio. They are abandoning and despising him, particularly by its friends. Even scorning, you could say. Scorned. Scorned. Yes, scorned. Yeah, yeah. desprecio. Wherefore, thank you very much, uh, Francesca. And please do correct my pronunciation because I'm sure I, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing it always well. Wherefore, David presently continues saying, Thou hast put far from me my friends and acquaintances. They have counted me an abomination. Psalm 87, uh, verse uh, 9. To all this will Jonah, Jonas um, testify as one who likewise experienced it in the belly of the beast both bodily and spiritually. So bodily, physically, he was inside of the beast, but spiritually also. That's interesting how he sees uh, Jonah's experience, Jonah's, Jonah's experience. Thou hast cast me forth, he says, into the deep. This is all from um, Prophet Jonah, uh, chapter 2, verse 4 to 7. Thou hast cast me forth, into the deep, into the heart of the sea. You see, try to read it spiritually, not just bodily. And the flow, the flood, the flood hath compassed me. All its billows and waves have passed over me. And I say, I am cast away after, uh, out of the sight of thine eyes, but I shall once again see thy holy temple which he says because God purifies the soul in this state that it may see his temple. The waters compass me even, uh, even to, to the soul. The deep hath closed me round about. Uh, the ocean hath covered my head. I went down to the lowest parts of the mountains. The bars of the earth have shut me up forever. By these bars are uh, by these bars are here understood in this sense imperfections of the soul. The bars of the earth have shut me up forever. Cerrojos. By these bars, imperfections. We, he means imperfections of the soul which have impeded it from enjoying this delectable contemplation. Now, remember, you see, he's going back to his same initial point. Contemplation in itself is delectable. 
But because we are not pure, all the impurities, all the attachments, all the habits that are in us, that needs to go, and you are, we are united to them, as he said, in the old man. They are impeding, they are stopping us from having this delectable contemplation. It's the same God. It's the same contemplation. But now, at this very moment, a deep purification is still needed. After, you, re you need to read, really, uh, many stanzas of the spiritual canticle and the entire living flame of love, his book, his final book, you need to read them and see what he says about this delectable contemplation. It is incredible. You have the impression that it is completely, you're dealing with another author. It's not John of the Cross anymore. It's somebody else who is talking. And he himself says, the, 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 the work of the Holy Spirit is to do whatever is needed first. If purification is needed, then the Holy Spirit will then realize a, a, a purification. But if union is what is needed, or further sending sparkles and, or, 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 and other things, then the Holy Spirit will do it, because there is no obstacle then. If the person is purified and united, then the work of the Holy Spirit is completely different. Is leading the soul to do certain things. Why? Because the soul is not opposing any resistance anymore. The soul is united. The spirit and the soul are united to God himself. So the Holy Spirit um, has a great ease to realize his, um, his divine uh, operations. You see? It's the same Holy Spirit. But the effect is, is and the work is completely different because he, he fulfills the, the first need. We cannot do the other need. This is why when people said, oh, we can go to a little bit of union and then come back to a little bit of purification. It's like, how can you have union if you don't have, if the purification isn't, hasn't ended yet? What type of union then you, you are talking about? Progress toward union, yes, of course. You have a progress in the purification, progress, progress, yes. But union per se which is spiritual marriage or further stages further steps inside of this, this spiritual ma marriage how can you how can you say you reach that and then you come back again i mean what are you talking about you see you see how it doesn't it doesn't add up it doesn't make sense So it's the imperfections which impede the God, uh, which impede the, the, the human being, the person, from enjoying this delectable contemplation. So the action of God is gentle. The action of God is delectable, but it's not perceived as such. Okay? Now, that was the third kind, okay? The th which is the divine and the human are united. You remember when we started this chapter? The third kind is the divine and the human. Uh, they come together. They are. They are. They come close to each other, and this is the effect that we see. Now, the fourth cause of the pain is the following: the fourth kind of pain is caused in the soul by another excellence of this dark contemplation, which is its majesty and greatness from which arises in the soul a consciousness or a perception of the other extreme, which is in itself, namely, that of the deepest poverty and wretchedness. This is one of the chiefest pains that it suffers in this purgation. Contemplation the majesty and greatness of this contemplation makes the soul feel the other extreme. God, is, the majesty and the greatness of God, when it comes to contact to us, it makes us feel intimately our poverty and misery, the deepest poverty and wretchedness. You see, when they come together when they get, get closer. Hmm? 
So what is he trying to say here? He's trying to remind us of the majesty and greatness of God. Very often we treat God like, yeah, we know God, God did this, so Jesus did this, did that. But Jesus is God and God is holy, holy, holy. Jesus is God. The majesty and the greatness. The majesty and greatness of the Holy Spirit. We, we deal with the Holy Spirit as if we are dealing with uh, just uh, something, no? No, this is God. So when this majesty and greatness draw closer to us, we have this extreme, greater and an extreme perception of our uh, deepest poverty and wretchedness. And this is, as he says, the chiefest pain. The chiefest pain. For it feels within itself a profound emptiness and impoverishment of three kinds of good, temporal, natural, and spiritual, which are ordained for the pleasure of the soul, which are the temporal, natural, and spiritual, and finds itself set in the midst of the evils contrary to these, namely the miseries of imperfection, the aridity and emptiness of the apprehensions of the faculties, faculties being um, at least the chief ones, mind, will, and, and, and memory, and abandonment of the spirit in darkness. So what is the perception? What do we feel? A profound emptiness and impoverishment. Impoverishment. No, it's like I'm less than what I was before. So the paradox is here. The more we grow, the more we lose. Exactly as the, the Lord says in the gospel. If you want to win, if you want to uh, uh, gain the, your, your, your life, or, or uh, you have to lose it. You see? If you want to gain, if you want to add more, you need to lose more. This is what the, 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 the Lord says. The gospel, in fact, is everything upside down. You want life, you need, you need to die. And if you want to, to live, well, then you're dying. <clears throat> if you want to be the first, you need to be the last. And if you are, and, and if you are the last, then you will be the first. You see, everything is upside down in the, in the gospel. We, f we forget this from time to time. no? So you want richness, you need to go... Uh, to reach spiritual poverty and spiritual poverty is not just poverty it's uh, la lack of attachment but also it's spiritual poverty which means i rely only on god but n on no other goods no other spiritual good so it feels uh, the person is affected not only spiritually here he says but also in the, in the temporal the net, natural and the spiritual the the three these three uh, levels in daily life daily life affected could be work could be family could be any other elements the natural capacity the personal capacities to do certain things and so forth and the spiritual which is the uh, spiritual life and uh, etc now uh, and finds itself set in the midst of the evils contrary to these namely miseries of imperfection aridity and emptiness of the faculties and abandonment of the spirit so the faculties are not enjoying any more necessary prayer or spiritual life the person has great difficulty to pray, great difficulty to just align few words or one after the other, or to have some thoughts or to meditate or to, to sort of uh, uh, meditate at length uh, the word of God or something. The person is just hanging, no? holding, I don't know, a cross or a rosary, and then it's just, just, uh, just hanging. Does the person see anything right now, immediately, spiritually? No. So all the goods, the spiritual goods that the person had are gone, and now immediately there is no good. So it's it's not a... a, a, a remember Peter, it's the same. Huh? It's the same. He lost everything. 
Inasmuch as God here purges the soul according to the substance of its sense and spirit, so the substance and the faculties, so the substance of the person, the habits, and also the faculties, according to the interior and exterior faculties, the exterior, interior, and exterior uh, faculties. The soul must needs be in all these parts reduced to a state of emptiness, poverty, and abandonment, and must be left dry and empty in darkness. So the purification implies the loss of all these things. So really, it is, it is, a, it is a tough... Um, it looks a bit scary, I have to say, when you follow the description he makes, and you can understand that sometimes, yeah, um, the, some people can reject the idea that such thing can happen. And they can even reach a point where to, to say that it's not for everybody and, and so forth. I just invite you to study St. Rise of the Child Jesus and see how she undergoes these things. Uh, what are the tools she uses and the means she uses in order to um go in this direction of losing um, everything and to add to this why saint therese because saint therese says that her way is for everybody her way is for all the souls especially the weakest souls so if saint therese says that her way is for the weakest i hope you can consider yourself a weak at least, no? Uh, therefore, you fall in the category of people uh, who are supposed to receive the teaching of St. Therese of the Child Jesus. So, if she went through this, why not? For the sensual part is purified in aridity, the faculties are purified in the emptiness of their perception, and the spirit is purified in thick darkness. Okay, I think I will stop here. If you have um, any question right now, please don't hesitate to um, ask um, anything we saw. I know I haven't explained certain um, words above right now, but um, majority, I think, uh, look um, reasonably... <clears throat> understandable uh, I don't know is it 15 I think 16 yes if I'm not wrong well, I'll check this later so any question Jean yeah can you go back to the text one second yes sure Maybe you said it, but here it says the faculties are purified in the emptiness of their perceptions. Here the faculties are what? Knowledge, the our mind, our will, and our memory. No? Yeah, but you yeah, these are the, 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 the rational ones, but you have plenty of other faculties like imagination, inner sense, and so forth. And for if we follow his anthropology, yes. What can we understand under you know the 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 emptiness of the perception of the will, for example, or of the mind, is that? The, the mind will be then the, the act of faith, will be uh, purified and empty. The mind will be not finding anything, uh, in, in a total incapacity to compose uh, two or three thoughts in order to pray or say something to God, for instance. Okay. Uh, uh, the love, I don't feel any anything. I say uh, I love God, but I don't feel anything. On the contrary, I feel that he's upset with me and so forth. So the perception okay. here oh, is like the absence of, of, of feeling. Yeah. Uh, so it's like losing all that initially was, quote unquote, a bit of consolation for the mind, the act of faith, the act of hope and the act of love, all what has added a little bit. Now, he takes it away. So it's all not... of these acts have to be made then purely by sort of a strong will and courage. 
the the yeah of course the main the main challenge during the 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 dark night is god is in fact cornering us to push us to produce a strong and pure act of faith that we never produced before which is not relying on any of the spiritual goods and bearings that we had before or perception remember in the book two of of ascent of mount carmel yeah saint john of the cross is teaching what to do if we receive these consolations or visions or anything in this actual phase what is the difference between this phase which which is a God's response to our uh, active phase, which is uh, the, the ascent of Mount Carmel. The ascent of Mount Carmel, for instance, book two and three, John of the Cross is teaching us what, how to behave in front of the <clears throat> visions or feelings we can have when we make an act of faith or, or act of love and so forth. This teaching is good, but will it accomplish the transformation? No, it is just my part and my disposition. I'm happy, Lord, I understand that I shouldn't rely on this, but I'll do my best. Now, in this, in, 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 this is God's answer, this contemplation, this new intervention, this, this, um, infused uh, mm -hmm. contemplation god removes himself all the, the the senses so what what john of the cross said you shouldn't rely on it now it's not even given it's removed so in and you still have to make the pure act of you prayer. have to make it it's not your your you have you still have now now for the first time in your life you will produce an act of faith, for instance, let us say that, an act of faith that you never produced before. Why? Why? It's very important, your question. Before, when you made the act of faith, you had these um, at least sort of spiritual bearings, what I call the spiritual bearings, which is a perception when you pray, you have a sense that you are praying when you are doing, uh, um, I don't know, certain types of uh, uh, prayers or activities and so forth. You you sense that you still have your your the same bearings. So your act of faith in this context is still easy to make. Mm -hmm. While if he takes everything and he says, okay, now give me an act of faith, you say, how? You, you become aware that, in fact, before, when you made your act of faith, you were leaning on what was perceived, but you weren't aware before. Now you are aware because he removes it. You see? Mm. It's like, for instance, Jesus dies, and then God says, make an act of faith in the resurrection. Wow. Wow. Jesus is dead. But if Jesus is still alive, go back a few weeks or a few months before the Passion, Jesus says, believe in me. Peter will say, of course, I believe in you. Of course, I believe in you. He's making an act of faith. But it's easy. Jesus is in front of him. Yeah. He has a feedback. Yeah. He has a feedback and he re re um, uh, lies on um, this feedback in order to make the act of faith. Now Jesus is gone and then the angel says to him, make an act of faith. Peter says, I can't. This is why and this is a turning point. Uh, unfortunately, John of the Cross doesn't mention this part, but other uh, masters do mention it. Father, Blessed Father Marie Eugène Relying on Mary here is fundamental. And in fact, when you think about it, this is what happens to the, to the apostles. Sorry for this addition. Mary 
truthfully is the only one who believes in the resurrection. When you read all the accounts of resurrection in Matthew, Mark, uh, Luke, and, and, and John, you see that nobody waited for the risen Lord. Neither the holy women, nor Mary Magdalene, nor Peter, nor John. The only one, and it's not stated explicitly in the text, it's implicit, is Mary who believed. Now, Peter has to, Peter and all of, all of, all of us, we have to cross from 3 p.m. Uh, on Friday till the early hours of Sunday, even though we are after, we are after Sunday, but we still have to redo this, this work. Which is what? Discovering and accepting that somebody believed for us. That Mary waited for him. And the, the first apparition occurs to Mary. This is why the angels are blaming the, the, the holy uh, women. Uh, because they say to them, why are you searching for the living amongst the dead? They are blaming them. You do not believe. You are searching for a dead person. He is the living. He is alive. He is not dead. Where is Jesus? Did Mary go to the, to the sepulchre? Did, did she go to his tomb? No, she didn't. And the, the gospel is clear on that. You can't deny it. Now where is she? She's at home. And where is he? Is he, is he in the cemetery? cemetery? Is he in the, in the, in the, in the tomb? No. He went to see her. So the apostles will need time. Will need time to realize. That the act of faith. There is only one act of faith. And the act of faith is Mary's act of faith. It's all this is implicit in the gospel. Nobody can deny it. But it's not explicit. This is why he says to Peter in St. Luke, chapter 22, verse 23, I think. He said, I prayed for you. Satan claimed your soul to shake it. But when you will come back, strengthen the faith of your brothers. When you will come back, and this is me, of course. It's not John of the Cross. It's me, but I don't think he will disagree. But I say it humbly. Uh, when you will come back means... When you will accept and discover that Mary believed for you, not only believed, and that's it, for herself. No, she was carrying you, and she knew that uh, all this will happen, but she still carried you in hope and faith and love and waited for the resurrection in her name and in your name. So go back to her and, and hang on to her faith. So coming back to your question. The faculties don't have any more the bearings they had before because he disappears. Everything disappears. So what are we supposed to do? As Father Mary Jean puts it, he said, you go to Mary. But in which sense do you go to Mary? You acknowledge that she believed for you. This, this is a huge discovery, a huge step uh, ahead. Her faith becomes my faith, as John Paul II says it, you know, her faith becomes the faith of the people of God. It's incredible um, uh, to, to say that. You know? So it's not any faith, it's her faith. So the faculties are emptied. And I say to Mary, well, believe for me, I accept your faith. Do I see anything? No. Do I feel anything? No. But I know that she believes for me. So this faith that John of the Cross is teaching us, I personally see it as Mary's faith. Of course, I, I, I don't have uh, uh, an explicit uh, statement uh, from him, but uh, I rely more on for instance, Blessed Marie Eugène, who, said, who explains it, and it's beautiful, it's, it's perfect. But I don't want to impose it on anybody if, if uh, it's not in the text of John of the Cross, unfortunately. So.
There is very little mention of Our Lady, even though it is very deep. Uh, when he mentions Our Lady, it's incredibly deep. Uh, he says that only the Holy Spirit works in her, which means there are no obstacles in Mary. Uh, the Holy Spirit does whatever he wants to do in her, uh, full of grace. It's another way to, to explain full of grace. And he mentions that, uh, her, he mentions her another moment also very deep. So, yeah, I, I don't know if I explained Thank you. You're, you're most welcome. I do apologize for people who, who want only John of the Cross and no addition. Uh, I think this book, uh, I will uh, not be uh, faithful 100% uh, to only uh, John of the Cross because I think that the Dark Knight needs needs to be seen that it it's not that far-fetched uh, so i rely on the gospel i rely on blessed father Maria eugene i rely on saint Therese of the child jesus and rely on on our lady and i leave it there you don't have to believe but if you believe you you will see the result okay glory be to the father and to the son and to the holy spirit as it was in the beginning it's now and ever shall be well without end. Amen. Thank you very much.